So yes, thank you for the invitation to speak today. It's a real privilege and pleasure to be here. And um, hopefully everyone's feeling refreshed after a break. And thanks for the talk so far and the conversation. So as Helen said today, I'll be sharing the Barber's journey so far to explore the intersections between art, health, well-being, and the medical education at the University of Birmingham. And this is very much a practical case study of live work that's happening now. So firstly, a little bit about the Barber Institute. So we're located on the University of Birmingham campus, about three miles south of Birmingham city centre. We're housed in this wonderful purpose-built grade one listed art deco masterpiece that's here on the left. Unfortunately, we haven't been there for quite a long time and I'm still not there, but um, hopefully we'll be there soon. And on the right, you get a sense of our campus context. So this is the University of Birmingham. I've just circled where we are in relation to the campus. So we house and look after and work with an incredible fine art collection of paintings, sculpture, works on paper, decorative arts, and also a world significant collection of coins. And this is one of the most significant collections of art from the Western canon that was amassed in the 20th century. And we're fortunate enough to still be adding to the collection today. So the collection is housed in the most atmospheric and sensitively designed galleries that are pretty much um, as they were in the 1930s when we opened. And this is our blue gallery that gives you a sense of the space and this houses our 19th and 20th century works. So the first part of this presentation, I'm going to talk about a collaboration with the University of Birmingham's College of Medical and Dental Sciences. And this collaboration set out to use the Barber's collection to enhance the teaching and learning of future healthcare professionals. The collaboration began as many good things do with a chance meeting and a chat. So Jane Nicholl, senior lecturer from the University School of Nursing and now the Barber's Nurse in Residence that I'll say more about shortly, came to a lunchtime gallery talk that I was doing for new staff at the university. After the talk, we spent time looking at a painting together. And it quickly occurred to me that Jane saw this painting through her eyes. They were the lens of a nurse, the lens of a nursing lecturer, and the lens of a palliative care specialist. And I was absolutely captivated and fascinated immediately as I'd never looked at the works hanging on the walls in that way. So straight away, we decided to collaborate. This was back in 2017, and some of the conversations around healthcare in the NHS looked a little bit like this. So Jane and I were wondering, could working with art and working in a gallery setting help some of her nursing students to address some of these issues in healthcare? So Jane and I designed a taught session called Memento Mori for trainee nurses, and then it went on to be used with medics as well that would be delivered in the Barber galleries using the collection as a catalyst for learning about death, dying, loss, grief, and bereavement. Now, this is a subject that's absolutely central to all healthcare professions at all stages of their career. Yet it's absolutely under, excuse me, absolutely underrepresented in undergraduate courses. It's very challenging to teach in traditional academic formats, such as lectures and PowerPoints. And it's also a topic that society as a, in general really struggles to talk about and think about. So the workshop, as I said, is called Memento Mori, and we use about 15 to 20 works from the Barber's collection. Now, pre-COVID, it was a workshop of three hours on site at the Barber, working in the galleries face to face with about 25 students at a time. And if any of you know about medical cohorts, they're huge. So to get through a, even a one year cohort of nurses, we'd repeat this over about four or five times in a week. And then probably the next week, medical, I think we have 400 medical undergrads a year at the university, and that's just medicine. Now, during COVID over the last year, we've delivered it online through Canvas, which is the university's online portal for teaching 
and Zoom. And it's facilitated by Jane and I. And when the students come to us in groups of 25, they then break off into groups of three to five students. And in a nutshell, part one of the workshop, the groups look at all the workshops on the list, all the artworks on the list together. And they use guided questions and a ways of looking resource that Jane and I have designed. And we intentionally don't give them any art history handouts or information. And I thought Christina's point around how much information we give to audiences and participants and when was really pertinent. I talk very much with the students about the preciousness of first responses. You can never recreate a first response. Part two, they then in their groups choose about three works to focus on in depth and they record their thoughts and their conversations and they can share their own professional and personal experiences if they wish. And then part three, they come back into the whole group and they choose one work to share and feedback to the whole group, which then opens up a conversation around professional practice, personal experience, and how they might tackle some of these issues when they're out in clinical practice. And it's evaluated at the end of each workshop. We have ethics approval for this, and um, there is an academic paper in nursing education today, volume 89, if you're interested, that is an academic paper about these workshops. Now, many of these students, they're puzzled why they're coming to an art gallery, why they're using art, and what this is all about. And for many of them, their last visit to a gallery was probably a school trip. And that could have been back when they were 12 or 13, if they'd not gone on to study art beyond year seven or eight or nine. So um, we um, start from a very supportive and open place with this. So Jane and I have selected the list of works, about 12 paintings and sculptures and about 12 works on paper, some of which you can see here. The list is added to and edited every time we do this. And it spans both figurative and abstract works. It spans time and place and media. So in the following slides, I'm going to share a selection of student responses to some of the works. And these responses are drawn from the last three years across nursing and medical students of various year, years. Now, aware that you are the landscape research group, I've intentionally chosen four landscapes that we work with. Um, because hopefully that will pique your interest. And the comments I'm going to show you, they will be available in the recording, of course. So if you don't have time to read them all now, hopefully you can catch up with them afterwards. So this first work here um, by the French painter de Vigne from 1867, a seascape. This is a really large work in the galleries. Um, I loved seeing that constable painting earlier, the stormy sea at Brighton. And I thought, gosh, there's such a correlation between the two. And then, um, in this work, the students very often pick up on the theme of nature and perhaps a sense of being a human in a much bigger ecosystem, being part of the natural world, being part of a universe. And perhaps that gives solace or gives some kind of answers when facing death or loss or grief or bereavement. So we often talk about the multi-sensory elements of this picture. So as Christina said, um, that's really interesting here. And I've had students say, I, could, I can imagine myself standing on that rock and screaming in grief and nobody would hear me because the waves would um, kind of uh, envelop the sound and there's nobody there. So again, this point about whether there are figures in the picture or not are, are interesting. So um, as Rebecca said in her comment, I think this is a noisy picture and it very often gets picked up in that way with implied sounds. Also the scudding clouds across the sky and um, very often we get conversations around a sense of movement. It's not going to stay the same and the process of dying and the process of loss and grief and bereavement never stays the same. It's a moving process. So they pick up on that metaphor too. Um, next, we've got this painting by um, Nor the Norwegian romantic painter Dahl. This is Mother and Child by the Sea from 1840. And um, again, this is the only one I've picked with two figures in. So that's interesting based on our conversations before the break. Um, very often the students pick up on the two figures and place themselves in that position. 
And they wonder whether, are they waiting for somebody to come back or willing somebody to come back? Or are they seeing somebody off and departing? And is that a point between one world and another or one state and another? Um, as you can see, there's two comments here that link the picture to theories of loss, grief and bereavement. And we asked the students to do pre-reading around that. And it's really interesting to see how they weave in the theoretical with the works of art when we're in the session. Um, this work is Primrose Hill Winter by the British painter Frank Arbach from 1981-82. And so often on this, with this work, they pick up on the brush strokes, the texture, the qualities of the paint and the color palette. And very often that's linked to emotional states around death and loss, chaos, isolation, memory, for example. We sometimes also talk about Frank Auerbach's particular biography and the loss and death that he experienced early in his life, and perhaps why you would choose to represent the world in the way he does, having been through that experience. And finally, Ripe Cornfield Evening by um, the German artist Arthur Illies. This is a really extraordinary colour etching. And here, again, this comment, particularly on the bottom right, is just fascinating. I would never have looked at this work in this way. So this student is looking at the corn and looking at the orange corn and the blue corn, and that they both represent different types of behaviour within a model of grief and loss. That just blows me away. I, a whole new way of looking at visual works, I think. They also pick up with this work around peace and hope, but then also sometimes isolation and loneliness. So coming up now are just some student comments from the workshops to show how they're received and also some images of the in-gallery workshops, which now seem like a very distant but fond memory, but hopefully we'll be back. So um, here you can see students thinking about how they look at the theory and then think about applications in the workshops. And though not a conventional method of teaching, I've walked away with powerful lessons today. And Jane and I are very interested in the model of emotional learning and having that emotional connection with a work and a visual art piece is so powerful very often at, at arousing those emotional connections that then the theory and the practice and the application can really fall into place. Here you can see some students saying that they don't get much coverage around death on their course and they feel it should be mandatory. And one of the things that Jane and I were astounded by was the power of the physical gallery space and being in the company of a physical artwork. It has been so powerful from day one. And um, here you can see when, I mean, when they're on these kind of healthcare courses, it's astonishing the amount of content they have to fit into a short course. And um, they're on clinical placements or they've got deadlines. They came here for three hours and it affects their ability to think and their ability, the pace of thinking, the depth and the quality of that thought and engagement. And here, as you say, much better than being in a week of lectures, my favourite part of med school in three years. So um, we thought, well, we'll take that. I thought it was interesting just to make some reflections on the gallery to online conversion that we've been forced to do over the last year. Interestingly, over the last year, the online sessions, the students have been particularly drawn to the landscapes on the list, more so than ever. And I think there's something in that, in what we've talked about already this morning, this um, we haven't been able to travel and experience a vast variety of landscapes. So they've really tuned into them. They've also picked up a lot on the smaller scale works that can get overlooked in the galleries. And it's so interesting that the, gal the, the works exist outside of the gallery context. So they're just little rectangles on a screen. So the students have a very different relationship with them. They zoom in, they drag and drop them. They put one work next to another as if you can pick it up, which of course you can't do in the galleries. So their whole interaction is entirely different, which is so interesting. And also the works, they don't have any frames when they're shown online, they're just digital images. So they're without their frame or their case or their plinth, which is also interesting. 
So just before we move on to Barber Health, I thought I'd just mention, I can't talk in depth about this, but um, following these workshops in 2019 and 20, we then hosted two nursing students on an elective placement in their third year at the Barber. And they spent the academic year with us researching dementia access and dementia engagement at the Barber on the back of their Memento Mori workshop. If you'd like to find out more about this, just drop me a line. My details are at the end, but I just thought I'd pop in this quote from Hannah, and there's another one from Mayron coming up, the two students who took part, um, which I think are really powerful. And then to finish today, I'm going to talk about um, our newest iteration of this work, Barber Health which is a project to develop this collaboration and this work in response to the COVID-19 situation that we find ourselves in. So Barber Health in a nutshell, it places arts, health and wellbeing at the heart of our work and it's a commitment to work in this way for the foreseeable future. And we asked ourselves, as we were processing lockdown and living with COVID, how can the barber best support our communities in their COVID recovery? And we, within this, we count the university community as well. So we applied for a Art Fund Respond and Reimagine grant last year, and we were fortunate enough to receive that grant. So we're working on this project for 12 months, um, starting now in April. And the equation is very simple in my mind. It takes the barber and our collection and our assets then combines them with the College of Medical and Dental Sciences at the university, and then thinks about the needs and requirements of our really hyper-local communities in the COVID context. And it's activating the collection to see if we can make a positive difference, however small. The project has a number of components, the nursing residents, which I'll say a little bit more about in a moment, Death and Dying Community Conversations, which takes the Memento Mori model out into the community. Care Home and Extra Care Outreach, a social prescribing research and pilot project, and working with students from the College of Med Medical and Dental Sciences throughout all of these, through academic placements and collaborations and extracurricular work. So one of the things we've been asked most since we announced and launched this project is what's a nursing residence and why? So I thought I'd just say a little bit about that. So Jane Nicholl is our nursing residence for the next 12 months and she will be working with us one day a week for 12 months. And that has been uh, funded by the Art Fund and she has been backfilled from her role within the School of Nursing. So it's protected time, which is really key. Now, when we came up with the idea, we thought Jane would actually be with us in the building as a real residency. So at the moment, it's a digital remote residency, but we'll see where we end up in the next 12 months. And really, it's about Jane working with us to apply that unique lens I mentioned at the beginning to the collection and to think about new applications for the collection in terms of health, well-being and medical education. Hopefully, it will also act as an inspiration for others and inspire new partnerships with the medical professions. And she brings her contacts and networks, which it would take me and my team years to develop. And also from my point of view as a museum and gallery professional, it's also a live experiment to think about how we diversify our workforce in museums and galleries. We need to diversify our workforces in many, many ways. And that's a really current and pressing issue. And actually, if we think about the museum of the future, who do we really need to be working with? Who do we need in our teams? And who do we need on our payroll? And actually, for me, if we're going to work in arts, health and well-being, we need to really work with healthcare professionals and financially and properly support that as a partnership. So to finish off, um, we're embarking on Barber Health now for the next 12 months. I can't say exactly what it's going to look like and what the world will be like but we'll respond to the world and it will flex and change as we go. Um, but we've seen, and as Helen said in her introduction today, the power of art and landscape throughout the pandemic to connect, to inspire, to soothe and to heal. So we'll be using our collection with those words in mind and to contribute to this process of recovery. 
So thank you so much for listening. There's some links there and my details are there as well. And um, so please feel free to get in touch if you'd like any more information or like to discuss any work that you're doing that links. Thank you so much.